Being self-aware is one of the hardest things because it you have to be so objective about yourself, which is so subjective. And right. But I think it's getting feedback from other people and being vulnerable in that capacity. I think a lot of people don't want to be vulnerable, but you're only going to grow if if you do open up and let your guard down a little bit to kind of see what other people think. And then just kind of do kind of understand what our values are. What, what moral code do we want to live by? Welcome to the Pivotal Leader Podcast with Gina Tremarco, featuring lively interviews with CEOs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who share their stories and best practices for shifting business from problems to profits. Sit back and get ready to pivot. Hey, everybody. This is Gina Tremarco, Chief Results Officer of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. Each week on The Pivotal Leader, I feature inspirational leaders who know how to positively impact their customers, employees, and brand through culture building. On this episode of The Pivotal Leader, I am interviewing Julia Landauer, a two-time championship-winning NASCAR racer from New York City. Yes, not from North Carolina, New York City. With dozens of wins across different series, Julia has set records since she was 10 years old. Away from the track, Julia is a graduate of Stanford University, where she earned a Bachelor of Science in Science, Technology, and Society. During college, Julia was a contestant on season 26 of CBS's reality TV show, Survivor. It was also in college that Julia started her motivational speaking career with a TED Talk. Julia has since collaborated with Spotify, Disney Pixar, and the One Love Foundation, and has been written about by the New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, Entrepreneur, and ESPNW, to name a few. Julia is also an honoree of the Forbes 30 Under 30 list for sports. As Julia continues to develop her career and brand on and off the track, she uses her platform to advocate for STEM education and women's empowerment. Now settled in North Carolina, Julia is making her name synonymous with more than speed and grit. As she climbs the NASCAR ladder, Julia uses her racing platform to continue advocating for STEM education and women's empowerment. So let's dive into this episode and learn from Julia Landauer. Hey, Julia, welcome to The Pivotal Leader today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, it was really awesome hearing you. I heard you in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at uh, Coastal Carolina University's Women in Philanthropy and Leadership Conference, and uh, you're very inspiring. And um, if you don't mind me saying, you're you're young. You're a bit younger than I am, and and that's inspirational because you're a woman doing all these amazing things. And I think you're such a role model to women and people of all ages. Oh well, thank you. That's really great to hear, and it's exciting. You know, I I know that I've been in a very privileged position, position my whole life to be able to pursue what I love and have the support of my family and everything. And so, as much as I can give back and help you know, empower others to kind of get after it themselves, the, the more I try to do. So I'm glad that I'm glad that it was a good discussion. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was gonna usually I have our guests talk a little bit about how they got to where they are. And I, I did a little bit of that in the bio, um, in the introduction. And instead, I'd rather just kind of jump in because I think we'll get to some of that backstory about you. You know, you have Two yeah, two totally. talk topics specifically on your website that really intrigued me, and I, I want to jump right in to can nice girls win races? And if you don't mind, I want to um, read that so our listeners hear it, and so if they hear that description. So, in this description of Julia's talk on this, it says, "In navigating the male-dominated field of racing, Julia began recognizing and grappling with stereotypes and negative assumptions about women at the early age of ten. These social and cultural norms have held women back for centuries, yet they must be tackled and overcome. Through colorful stories from her racing career, Julia addresses some of these stereotypes, how she overcame them, and the greater significance this process has for women and men who support women everywhere. Referencing studies she read about at Stanford, Julia delivers emotional and fact-based observations and uh, proposes various habits and mindsets that can help women succeed. I really would love to jump in and hear your thoughts, uh, and I'm sure you already do this in your talk, is reference some of those studies. I'd like to hear a little bit about that. And what are some of the habits and mindsets that 
can help women succeed. You know, right before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, the percentage of women CEOs is so low and why is that and how do we help them get up that ladder? So can you tackle that one? Yeah, uh, loaded question, but yes, I will do my best <laughs> to tackle. Um, so one of the studies that really um, stood out to me while I was at school is that researchers asked mothers to set a ramp however steep they thought their toddler could climb up. And toddlers are pretty much the same, you know, at, you know, at that age, regardless of gender and sex. Um, and so they asked them to set a ramp. And mothers routinely set the ramp steeper for boys than they did for girls. So basically, you know, from babyhood, parents and moms are, you know, priming girls to not push themselves, to not take risks, and to not learn how to fall down, and then most importantly, how to pick themselves back up. So from a very early age, you know, girls aren't getting that encouragement to go find their limits. And so it's no wonder that so many, you know, teenagers and young women and older women, um, you know, have a hard time maybe finding their full potential or other people, outsiders might have a hard time seeing that women can be wildly successful because they're just not encouraged from an early mm-hmm. age. And so when I saw that growth, you know, that gross generalization, but a study still, it, um, it was really uh, interesting because I know that I wasn't raised like that. My parents made an active effort to make sure their girls, you know, fell down, got back up, hurt themselves, healed themselves, both emotionally and physically, because once you know you can get through it, you're that much stronger. So I think that that's, you know, because that starts so young, I think it's important to point out as much as we can so that parents might be able to catch themselves and let their daughters do the more challenging things because it really gives boys a huge advantage to Mm -hmm. be able to just, you know, go out there and know, okay, I can push myself this hard and this result will happen. Or, you know, how do I become comfortable in an uncomfortable situation, right? How do you become comfortable with the discomfort that you need for any kind of growth or any kind of success? So I think that root study kind of shows a lot of what we have to work on as a society. Well, that's, that's really interesting because this really goes, stems back to early childhood for most women, right? Mm We're because, you know, our parents are thinking they're doing the best by us um, to, to keep Mm -hmm. us protected as little girls uh, could actually hold us back in, in the long run. Yeah, totally. And everything from like the physical, like not letting girls climb on things or not wanting them to do that to, you know, less physical, like don't do things that will make your clothes dirty. Like, (laughs) I think that, you know, don't ruin your dress, right? (laughs) Like that kind of stuff is so harmful um, to girls. And then again, it just reinforms them that, you know, their appearance is the most important thing, which is you know, oh, appearance yeah. and how you present yourself is important, right? I don't want to diminish that, but it's not the most important. Right. It shouldn't be the top priority. And obviously, you, the way you were raised, because you started racing at, at age 10. So obviously, you have that very supportive family. Let's talk a little bit about how you got started racing at 10 and what, it, what did that look like? And do you have, do you have brothers and sisters? And how, how was all that? Yeah. So I'm the oldest of three. It's me, my sister, and my brother. And my parents were, again, this, this was actually me kind of being lucky in this regard, but my parents were looking for an activity that all their kids could do together on the weekend, but also one where their girls could actively compete against boys. Mm. So again, I, I got, again, lucky with that. In doing that, the other thing with go-karting is that, you know, kids are interacting with adults and they're given a lot of responsibility to manipulate a machine and you know to be able to articulate feedback so there's so much more from a you know just personal development standpoint that was really great about go-karts um but yeah that's how we got started and you know it was me and my sister the first year and then my brother joined the next year and we were all expected that we would work really hard and do what the maximum of what we were capable and hopefully that would be winning and for me it was and I loved it and I loved the puzzle component of you know you had to make sure the vehicle was as good as it could be and the driver as good as they could be. And you, know, you had to hope that no one took you out or crashed into you and that nothing fell apart and that, you know, all these different factors, some are in your control and some are not. Um, but when you make them all work perfectly and you win, it's incredibly satisfying. And what were some of the challenge that, challenges that you had um, as a young girl, age 10, as a racer? And what other challenges did you experience as you continued on? Yeah, so I think the first 
The first time I really felt like I was different was whenever we had driver's meetings. So you practice a few sessions in the morning and then you have a driver's meeting where all the drivers, you know, get, and they go over the logistics of the race day and everything. And at 10, I wasn't openly welcomed into some of the other groups of boys that were hanging out. And I had my one, one or two friends at the racetrack and I had my sister, but that's where I started to feel like, oh my goodness, I'm an outsider. Why? I an outsider here why do I sell cooties I mean like what is it that <laughs> that yeah what is it that's making people you know not want to hang out and I found out later that some of it was that parents felt that I was threatening their boys by because I had proven that I could win and everything um so it was just you start to see these very firsthand instances of being treated differently because of something you were just born with so that was that was interesting and I found I mean there's this this conversation could go on forever, but <laughs> probably the hardest thing, and Danica Patrick, who just retired from the top level of NASCAR, she talked, finally started talking about this like a little bit more recently. But I think that because so few women have proven that they can win at high levels of racing, earning the respect of the team to get them to want to put in 110% can sometimes be an obstacle. And I think that's mm-hmm. been the hardest thing and kind of has the most direct effect on my performance and my results. Uh, you know, if I'm putting in 110% and they're only putting in 95%, you know, there are other teams that are going to put in as much as they can. And so just, it's little things like that that I think hurt women a little bit. And on the flip side, once I do earn the respect and gain the trust of the people I'm working with, my team members, uh, they are the most loyal because I think they start to recognize some of the obstacles that women racers face from an attitude perspective and then also on track and how people drive us differently because you know god forbid you get beat by the girl uh, <laughs> which is still very much a it's still very much an attitude that a, not an insignificant number of people have so it's, it's an interesting uh, battle so would you say that you talk about earning the respect of a team would you say that that's a strategy a part of that habits and mindsets that you would propose for women in general to try to do to to totally. be able to succeed yeah i mean no one can achieve any kind of greatness by themselves i mean maybe a handful of people can but for the most part none of us are going to do it by ourselves and to be able to have a team that trusts you that has faith in you that feels that you have faith in them i think is really interesting and so um i got pretty lucky in 2015 when i won my championship because my team owner was a multiple national multi-time national champion and he didn't care who you were if you were in his equipment he wanted you to win um and that was the expectation because he knew that his stuff was capable of winning and so that was really cool and i you know everyone saw that i did well and i won my first race so that was an easier season but 2016 and 2017 were much more difficult and despite having a championship the previous year i had to really learn what kind of leadership style I needed in order to help the two teams. And I didn't realize this until 2017 when I, you know, tried to use the same techniques that I had for my 2016 team. It didn't work as well with the people huh. on my 2017 team just because, you know, different personalities, they right. re- react and respond to different things and different attitudes. And, um, you know, I could be, I felt more serious and pushing and still upbeat, but really challenge my team in 2016 and I felt like I had to take a different approach in 2017 and be a little more you know soft and not so hand-holding but it was just a very different leadership style and so that puts a lot of responsibility on the driver then to be able to recognize what the people need to give you the best. That takes a lot of self-awareness and awareness Mm -hmm. in general right to be able to read your team. Um, We talk a lot about like being able to read your audience uh, and I don't think a lot of people get to that so soon in life. It's taken me a long time to get good at that. How did you get to that point to be able to realize that so quickly that you had to treat each team differently? Well, I'll be honest. I think being on Survivor when I was 20 years old um, was really my rude awakening that I was probably <laughs> lacked a bunch of self-awareness. Um, I was on season 26 and you know I thought I was projecting a certain thing and that people were you know, perceiving me a certain way. And I found out as it was airing in front of 9 million people that I was wrong and that people uh, perceived me very differently. And Hmm. so it was a very, you know, very hard hitting wake up call that then resulted in me doing a lot of hard work. And being self-aware is one of the hardest things because it's 
you have to be so objective about yourself, which is so subjective. And right. But I think it's, you know, getting feedback from other people and being vulnerable in that capacity. I think a lot of people don't want to be vulnerable, but you're only going to grow if, if you do open up and let your guard down a little bit to kind of see what other people think. And then just kind of, you know, it's always been emphasized for us, you know, my siblings and I to kind of understand what our values are, what what moral code do we want to live by. And it doesn't have to be the same for everyone, but, you know, figure out what the pillars are that are most important mm-hmm. to you. And then that can kind of guide, you know, how you project yourself, how you treat others. And so I think it's a lot of hard work. And so that, you know, I had that wake up call when I was 20 and I'm 26 now. And I think, you know, it took those four or five years to really kind of keep fine tuning and keep testing and keep practicing and um, being sensitive to other people. And I think, you know, kind of taking a more communal approach, I think something that I've feel like in America is that, you know, the individual is so glorified, which is good. It means that a lot of people feel that they can go do a lot of things and accomplish a lot, which is great. But I think emphasizing communal components helps you learn how to read other people. Mm -hmm. And it helps you learn how to, you know, help people a certain way and then, you know, be aggressive at other times. So it's just, you need to be out there with people to know how to, or have a better idea of how you might want to help lead them. Well, that's that's interesting. There's a parallel, I think, um, to the improv comedy world, which is I, I own an improv comedy theater as well in Myrtle Beach. And mm-hmm. it's it's very much about the communal. And when you look at the difference, a lot of times people mistake improv with stand-up. And they think we're doing stand-up, mm. stand-up comedy shows, which is, you know, one person. And they, they, they script it, they memorize it, they deliver it. And I've had several stand-up comedians take our classes and they really struggled because they started from the stand-up perspective of this is my world. It's just me and my world on stage in front of you, the audience. And when the audience doesn't laugh, I've seen some of them say, hey, that was funny. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that every audience is different, just like you were talking about. Every team is different. And if your audience doesn't laugh at you, well, that audience didn't find it funny. And you have to be yeah. perceptive uh, in improv because we're not on a script. The second we can feel the audience be unhappy, then we shift really quickly. Or right. if we feel that they loved what we did, we keep doing it. Yeah. And we're working in a totally. te- we're working in a team to do it, so that there's a group of us working on getting to the same goal of entertaining the audience, and then we take mm-hmm. that, that entire concept and we we put that in business too. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's the same thing for me when I get on stage, right? You know, a lot of some of the stories I tell I've been telling for a few years now because they are so potent and yeah. they resonate with a lot of people. But there are some that I started with that I thought were awesome. Hilarious, <laughs> and I got a lot of like awkward, silent faces from the audience. And you yeah. learn really quickly, as you said, that all right, that didn't work, or maybe I have to deliver it a different way. And right. it's being humble enough to realize that you might not have all the answers right now, um, which doesn't mean you're a lesser individual, right? But very few of us are so incredibly perfect and awesome <laughs> that we don't need to adapt and grow a little bit, right? As we, you know, as we move on. How have you gotten support and mentoring um, to get you to this place of constantly bettering yourself? That's a great question. Um, So as I said, I've always had really supportive parents who have also been very aggressive, as you heard some of the stories I told in (laughs) Myrtle Beach. My parents have an aggressive parenting style. And part of that was, you know, emphasizing self-awareness, emphasizing constant growth. And then when I was in school at Stanford, you know, the growth mindset was a huge part of a lot of the design school classes that I took. And it just makes sense. You want to better yourself. And if you take the position that you constantly have things to to improve upon, then it, may, it means you're pushing yourself to new places that you might not have found otherwise. And that's really exciting for me. And so there's that. I think, you know, I've had good mentors from the racing community and otherwise that you know, kind of help identify potential, even if, you know, whether it's from like a financial side, okay, how much, you know, should I charge someone for a certain service? I, you know, just Mm -hmm. recently found that I probably undervalued myself. And had I not spoken with a mentor ahead of time, 
I probably would have really undercut my financial compensation for something. So it was really, it's just really nice to be able to learn, okay, where, where do I give myself enough credit? Where do I not give myself enough credit? And then as you get more and more examples of things working, it, you're able to jump off from there from every next opportunity, if that makes sense, uh, kind of yeah. in a different direction than I was originally planning. But <laughs> I think that if you can have outside eyes and ears that you trust, and I don't think you want too many because if you have too many cooks in the kitchen, then it just becomes messy. Well, yeah. So yeah. finding the core group of people who you trust and maybe you go to certain people for certain types of advice yeah. and other people for other types of advice. I've, I've also yeah. have experienced that through my career. There was a time when I, I, wa- I listened to what everybody had to say and it actually created so much noise in my head mm-hmm. that I sort of lost myself and got confused on what my own value and gifts were. And there was a point where I had to learn like what you're talking about. All right, these are the people I'm going to go to. And I don't have to listen to 100% of what they say. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I need to know where my value is. And and you touched on that. So I'm going to go off segue differently too. You talked about undervaluing yourself. And I know you do a lot of keynote speaking and I do a lot of speaking as well. And, you know, there's always that when you're trying to, you know, negotiate the speaking fee and, and go through that process. And I think a lot of women have this challenge of undervaluing themselves too and not mm-hmm. getting, I think a lot of times they're not getting paid what they should be getting paid because they've done it to themselves. And I know some women are going to cringe and get angry at that statement. I think often mm-hmm. we don't ask for more. How how did you get to a point of how did you get to a point of realizing you were undervaluing yourself, and why do you think you did it? Yeah, so um, I, I I get that of um, undervaluing, and obviously, as I said, I've done it. I do think that when it comes to pay, it nothing's operating its own silo, right? Like I do think that women, you know, women are known and there are studies of this that where they negotiate really well for when it's on other people's behalf. Um, but when it comes to negotiating for themselves, they're less strong. And part of that I do think is because, you know, a lot of employers and people who are making the payment decisions, they don't think that women for whatever reason should make as much. I mean, if they did, we wouldn't have the pay inequality right, right now, right? right? So there is a reason. Good point. For, yeah. Yeah, for women to feel like, okay, do they not deserve more? And oh, there are a bunch of studies you can look at that are really interesting. So like when I got started with speaking, right, my first speaking gig was a Stanford TEDx talk. So I knew that I was good enough to be on the TEDx stage. And they approached me and asked me to talk. And, you know, I knew I had this very good film that I could present to people. And then when I got my first gig, they kind of, they hired me to give that TEDx talk. And you know, I did a bunch of research. So what can you charge for this? And I, I gave them a number. They accepted right away. And so that's why I realized. <laughs> yeah, probably. yeah. That, that's the first sign. Yeah, yeah. That's the first sign. But then these, it was a women's leadership conference that I was speaking at. And um, I actually, you know, I had had like a couple meals with the people who were running the conference and these women really, you know, they wanted to help mentor people. And so at the end of, you know, the two day event, I felt comfortable enough asking like, hey, did I undervalue myself when I gave you my fee? And they knew that it was one of my first and I knew that they were taking a risk on me, right? So I asked them that and she, the woman who hired me said, yes, you did. I would have paid you double. So for me, that was a very lucky experience that mm. someone was willing to tell me what they would have paid me yeah. for my talk. And then that gig uh, got me set up with my speaking agent who I use. And you know, I use him for some things and uh, really great guys called Gotham Artists and they're out of New York and they're a little boutique firm. But being able to see what they're able to get for me has definitely helped me in setting my own price. And, you know, that's again, that's a, a lucky thing to have. And I spent I spent about two years trying to get an agent and no one wanted to work with me. So um, really, yeah, just because when you're an unknown, it's like, OK, well, they're not going to be, you know, a speaker or agent takes a fee. And yeah. so if they're not going to be able to get a lot for you, then it's not really worth the time, which I totally understand from a business perspective. So it was really great. It's been great to see my agent push. And again, that comes to having that core group of people who you trust to be able to help you self-actualize, uh, excuse me, for lack of a better phrase, um, yeah. and realize what, what you're worth. And then I can take that and say, okay, well, people you know, are now bringing me in for various consulting events. And like, okay, well, now I know how to judge this. I know what the work is and what I'm doing compared to speaking. And it's just, you just got to put yourself out there and keep trying. 
And, you know, if you oversell yourself or overvalue yourself, then people will say no really quickly and then you just negotiate. <laughs> and, you know, just exactly. if someone says no right away, it doesn't mean they're going to say no forever. Right. Right. They're just, and, and the way I like to view it is that whoever I'm talking with, and I don't know if this is true, but it makes me feel better. Um, <laughs> whoever I'm talking with, I have to assume that they were given a range of what right. they were approved to spend on me. And if I'm going to assume they're going to give me the lower range. So if I then negotiate upwards, I'm probably like more like the middle of what they're going to give me. Yeah. And for me, it's just, it's not a personal thing. It's that everyone has a budget and financial components are the most rigid that you'll ever deal with. And so understanding it's not a personal thing it's a business thing also yeah. really helps. Yeah. I actually have a friend who is also a keynote speaker. She recently went through some struggles where they were looking for some, and she works, she does a lot of speaking in like the, the tech arena and they were looking for women and this, you know, we could touch on STEM in a little bit too. They were looking for women to be speakers at this conference. But by the time they realized they needed women speakers, they had already spent their whole budget. And so they were trying to get women to come speak for free. And so that's, that's where she, that's where she had the challenge of yeah uh, you you paid all these guys and yeah but you're not gonna pay us so yeah no that's awful and I think that and it puts you in a tough position because and when we talk about fees there are definitely some instances where the event itself is very valuable and worth being in but right, for right. for them not to find new budget or to reallocate certain things I find that very offensive and it's like all right, well, we need you because we have an image problem because we don't have any women. But, <laughs> right. you know, we don't need you enough to actually compensate you for right. coming in and providing value. And the way that I look at it, which, oh, another thing that was a game changer in terms of value, it was actually from Taylor Swift. And it was a quote, I guess, when there was the debate over why she wasn't having her music on Spotify. And she made the point that artists provide value to others. And if the work that I'm doing is providing value for others, and I'm not intending it to be philanthropic or volunteer work, then I should be compensated for it. And that's the way I look at it. You know, if I'm going in to motivate a group of like 500 people, right, that's 500 lives that someone right. thinks are worth impacting. Right. But then you're not going to compensate me to impact those lives. Like that is right. counterintuitive to me. If, if the work is valuable, and it is because you're talking with me in the first place, then I should be compensated. And I don't think that's an arrogant or selfish approach to take if you're doing something for profit. I agree. I want to keep on with where we were going. We were talking about value. I'd like to talk a little bit more about some habits that anybody, not just women, but habits that we can take on to, to succeed. Yeah, well, I think kind of the continuation of self-awareness is huge. Um, self-awareness is something we should all work on. And, and no matter how self-aware we are, we can always improve that. And um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a, lot of it, a lot of it's about you know, getting feedback from people, you know, really being purposeful in how you project yourself. And you know, what impression do you want to leave, whether that's when you're in a boardroom, if you're on stage, if you're with your coworkers, if you're in the grocery store at the cashier's line, you know, like how, how do you want to be perceived and be remembered? And are you doing that in every aspect of your daily life? And I think that's the best practice if you want to change something about yourself or if you want to work on something. And then in terms of other habits, I mean, there's a lot, I think, I think building allies is really important. And this is going to go on to, you know, a little bit back to female related things, but um, we talk about women having mentors and, you know, working together. And I like to point out that, you know, especially people of my generation, so millennials, we were raised in like that mean girls era, mm. right? Where there's very little yeah. media representation of women collaborating and working together. Yeah. And we're starting to see some of that change. And obviously the Me Too movement and Time's Up has been incredible for women coming together for a goal. But again, it's not a for-profit goal. So it's an interesting dynamic. It's still on the philanthropic side, which is good. It has to happen. But we're only just starting to see a real shift there and you know media likes pitting women against each other but from my perspective you know equality is a human issue it's not a women's issue but if we're not willing to help each other and support each other then why on earth would you know would we expect men to do it if we're not willing to help ourselves why should anyone else help us and i think that goes to you know beyond just you know equality issues you know it's 
if you, if you're trying to be successful, if you don't believe in yourself, why should anyone else? You know, that kind of treat yourself the way you want other people to treat you. And I think that's a good thing to keep in mind, regardless of what you're doing or what you're trying to achieve. And then building up the allies and, you know, the male allies for women, I think are really important to have, you know, the boys club is going to be hard to break into if you're a woman and Mm -hmm. if you're able to have a guy who will advocate for you and who believes in you and just helps point out what's unfair toward, towards the other guys. Like, I think that's really valuable. And I think we're in a position now where we really still need that, you know, yeah. women's voices aren't always strongest on their own. I think that that ally and collaboration is super important. And that goes again beyond just gender. Um, I think collaboration is one of the coolest things that we can do to society because innately everyone has their own strengths and own weaknesses and if you're able to bring those strengths together you have some really cool outcomes and whether that's you know in a romantic partnership a lot of times you know I know my parents who are high school sweethearts always talk about how if they were one person they would be the most superhuman person ever (laughs) but they have very noticeable flaws by themselves and so this idea that whether it's personal professional, you know, friendship wise, whatever it is, teams a lot of times are better than individuals. You know, and along those lines of uh, the Me Too movement, and I, at that same conference you spoke at, I was on a panel discussion about uh, sexual harassment and everything that's been been going on. And one of the things we talked about was some of this might backfire on women because men now are like, "Uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to act. I don't know how to be. I don't know what's right. And, you know, will there be any backlash on that, that some men are going to be scared to hire women or bring on women? And it goes back to that collaboration piece that we need to have conversations and we need to be open about it and not kind of run from it. And I too have recently experienced the importance of having both male and female mentors. And honestly, throughout most of my career, I've had more support from men than women. That was another discussion in in one of the um, sessions I went to on gender bias. There's that whole queen bee syndrome. The Mm -hmm. women, women come up. Yeah. And then they don't bring any other women with them. Yep. Because they're, they're afraid to for their own preservation and, and right. that's part of the problem. So going back to what you said, how's anyone else going to believe in us yeah. if, if we don't do that for each other? Yeah, I agree. And I think to your point and concern about, you know, Me Too backlashing, I think, and this is, again, where self-awareness and trying not to be stuck in your own little sphere of thinking is really important. You know, if this is coming to the surface, it means there was an issue. So yes, yeah. you could be nervous about hiring a woman because there might be backlash or then you have to be more careful. But if this is a real problem that millions of people are getting behind and acknowledging, then that's a human issue. Like that's, you've got to fix it. And so I think what's also important, like, you know, there've been some letters and, you know, um, op-eds about killing courtship. And I agree. I think that, I think it is a fine line, like harassment is wrong, but you know, are you going to say that if someone makes the first moves and asks you, you know, to dance, is that going to be harassment? I don't think it should be right. You don't want to take out, like courting and the romantic, like romance is messy, right? It is a little messy, but it's rooted in respect and the messiness is tolerable, right? If it's, if you're explicitly clearly making someone uncomfortable, I mean, there's so many (laughs) nuances and caveats here, but I don't think that Me Too is about, you know, killing the courtship or killing the natural, natural attractiveness between people, right? I don't think that's the issue. It's when you no longer respect the other person you're dealing with. And I think when it comes to work environment, that's something to keep in mind, you know, again, kind of grossly generalizing with guys and women or men and women. It's like, if you're a man and you're worried, oh, is this going to be perceived poorly? Well, how would you feel if someone else, doesn't matter if it's a man or woman, if someone else is doing that to you? If someone else made a comment about, you know, you, like, how would you feel? How would you want someone to behave towards your mother or your girlfriend or your daughter? Or you just like, you know, be a little more empathetic, in my opinion, and understand how it could be uncomfortable. And I think there are differences between men and women and what, I don't know, what's normal in terms of banter, or what makes some people uncomfortable. I think when it comes to appearance, I don't don't know, it's a little messy right there, but just be empathetic and, you know, understand where, you know, why might someone be uncomfortable? How could, you know, being uncomfortable then translate into the whole workplace environment? So it's just, 
it's doing things purposely and, you know, being critical of how you're interacting within the universe that you're working with it. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes back to, you know, don't be individualistic, be yep. collaborative. I was, I was just going to say that it goes back to really knowing the people that you're with and working with and dealing with and, you know, on the sur- if you don't know them very well, you, you know, you should be super careful. When, when all this kind, yeah. of went, <laughs> kind of went down, you know, a lot of this was the, this kind of Me Too stuff was also going down in the improv comedy world kind of quietly mm-hmm. and before yeah. everything blew up and there were several improv comedy theaters in the country that were experiencing a lot of these issues and there's kind of this upheaval about it. And I got concerned as a club owner, I'm like, oh gosh. I hope this isn't happening at my play. Like, and mm-hmm. I'm I'm one of very few female club owners, so that's mm-hmm. also unique. That could be a difference, yeah. And and I think it is because you know I I got really disturbed by a lot of what was going on in our industry, and I kind of I sent out this kind of huge note to our team of like, hey, if you ever feel this, or if I ever do that, and I'm not self-aware of it somebody take me down or somebody have a conversation (laughs) with me um and and i got super sensitive about it because in the comedy world we do an awful lot of sexual innuendo and Mm -hmm. i got big i became highly sensitive to it i'm like oh my gosh should we do that is that okay and you start you start doubting yourself but again it goes back to well we know each other so well Mm-hmm. We know. Yeah. And what like every situation, it's, just, it's being sensitive to yeah. it, right? It's just understanding that it may not work for some people or it might work for others, or, you know, you are in comedy, right? So I think it's just, <laughs> it's being aware of how others can perceive. And if people didn't like crude jokes, they wouldn't go to comedy shows or improv right. shows. You know, like I feel like I was watching, um, I think it was a Netflix documentary on Joan Rivers. And someone spoke up in one of her shows, I think in Wisconsin, maybe. um, And they said how insensitive she was to make a joke about, you know, X, Y, or Z. She called this guy out and it's like, you know, well, you're coming to a comedy show. Comedy is making fun of everything, you know, and it's making fun of everyone. Like, don't be so sensitive or don't come to the show if you don't like that humor. And I think that, again, it goes back to understanding what type of environment you're in. If you're in a collaborative place or if you're going to a show, you know, it, it draws in from inspiration from others. So um, and I just wanted to point out, like, I talk about, you know, don't be individualistic, be collaborative. I say that and I'm not saying don't be by yourself. Like, I work from home and I'm by myself most of my days, which I think is a real luxury. <laughs> um, but when you come, when it comes down to trying to go after something, that's where it's collaborative. When it comes down to how yeah. you're interacting with your community and your yeah. people around you, that's where collaborative is really important. Well, talk, let's talk a little bit about your, your team and how that works, because how many people are on a race team? So it depends on the level you're at. At the top level of NASCAR, I mean, there are hundreds of people on a team between the the engineers on one specific car and then the mechanics that work on that car and then the crew members that go to each race and they're, you know, Mm. on pit road and making the, you know, making the pit stops to the PR team, to the business and sales. So it's a real, you know, it's a big company. The teams that I've been on, you know, most recently, they've got about six crew members and the crew chief who makes the you know, technical calls on what to do with the car. And then there's a team owner who oversees the various drivers and various cars. And, and then, so that's on the racing side. And then, you know, even on my, you know, personal business team with Julia Landauer Racing, you know, I've got, I've got my manager, I've got me, I've got my speaking agent, I've got, um, you know, my lawyers and accountants. <laughs> and just again, keeping everyone on the same page. Yeah. So it's kind of twofold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what would you say is maybe one of the number one things um, you have done or number one strategies to earning the respect of your team? And is everybody on your team, I'm going to assume because I don't know any better, I'm going to assume that they're all men because it's such a male dominated yes. industry. Great assumption. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So the thing that's great with racing is that, you know, winning is so clear and such a huge motivator. And so as soon as you show results, like a lot of times that is a key thing for earning the sure. respect of your team. But I think a lot of it was how, you know, how I interacted with the guys, you know, making sure, you know, I knew something personal about everyone I was working with, making them feel human 
and not like they're working for me. I think that's really important. And, you know, in Silicon Valley, there's companies are now trying to work towards like a level management. And I think that's something that's really crucial for making people want to do their best. When yeah. people feel special in some capacity, they're going to work harder and they're going to be more loyal. And I don't mean that to do that in a frivolous way or in an authentic way. But again, it goes back to empathy, treat people the way you want to be treated. If I were in their position, how would I want my driver to treat me? And again, it's a level of responsibility that you have to put on yourself. But I think that as humans, we're capable of doing that. And I think we should elevate ourselves to that level. So basically taking the time to get to know the people on your team, having empathy, creating that relationship and that collaboration and all striving towards the same goal of winning, whatever yeah. whatever winning means for for you, your company, yeah. whatever. Exactly. There, everyone's gonna feel great if we hit our you know hit our goals and hit our marks. And yeah. so, what can we all do to make us most excited to get there? Can you share with us one thing that uh, didn't go so great for you on your team or maybe um, maybe a mistake uh, you made or something you're like, gosh, I wish I didn't do that, but I learned from it? I think when it comes to women raising their voices, we have a, a bit of an obstacle. I think men can yell at each other and then go get drinks afterwards. Like, you know, like <laughs> I think there's there's a different dynamic when women yell and especially or if it's just like raising their voice not even yelling at anyone but getting visibly frustrated and I just don't feel like it's tolerated as much like I guess we're supposed to be cute all the time and I think there's this weird power struggle between uh, women and men still uh, not with everyone but you know in my experiences where getting emotional on the angry end of the spectrum I think that 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 has backfired for me. So it's not really a mistake I've made, but it's something I've noticed hasn't worked. Okay. Um, and I don't think it's fair. I think that we should all be allowed to express emotions, especially if, if we're not actively tearing someone down. But maybe it might also be because, you know, as the driver and as the central component, the nucleus of the team, because everyone is working so that the driver can drive the car and win, right? So um, it might be that you know, showing that kind of frustration was disheartening to the team. But I do yeah. think there's an element of the being the woman who's getting emotional that yeah. didn't fit well. Yeah. Which that's... is a shame because men get emotional and no one thinks twice about it. Yeah, I was just actually talking about that today. Um at all places at, at my hairstylist place. We were having this exact <laughs> conversation, a bunch of women that um I think we're, stere- you know, clearly we're going to be stereotyped for being emotional because we are typically more emotional than men. Uh, but we get categorized as the bitch. And yeah, we're, we're different emotional. I mean, guys get so emotional on the angry side, right? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. So I think emotional is not like really taken in its full yeah. meaning when it's distributed to men and women. Yeah. Um, but sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah. Yeah, no, uh, the emotional man is like, oh, he's he's ups- he's mad. Okay, we better get our stuff together. And the emotional woman yeah. can be, pro- oh, gosh, she's such a bitch. Yeah. And that to me has been the, like, how do I, how do I manage that? If, if anybody finds the answers to that um, or anybody wants to uh, email me with answers for that, I'm sure um, everybody would Yeah, please benefit. do. Copy me on those emails. Yeah, I, I, I want to know. So any guys out there listening, if you have suggestions for us on how best to um, communicate um, when we're emotional, not be considered emotional and bitchy. I don't know. I'm, I'm looking for yeah. answers on that. Yeah, I don't have any strong insight into that one. <laughs> one one quick thing I want to talk about, because we were talking about, because you're like, yeah, that's right, to assume that it's an all-man team. I know that you're doing a lot of work to advocate for women in STEM. And let's talk a little bit about that, because you know, there are very few women in your industry. How how do you get more women in that industry? And what are you doing to advocate for women in STEM? Can we just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that it's it's a big question, and um, you know, one of the things I really love, you know, about the platform that I have is that all of the worlds kind of tie together really well. I lo- I have a bachelor of science. I think STEM fields are really interesting and great. You know, STEM is a broad, broad subject, but you know, lots of app- practical applications for various STEM tools. And racing is a STEM-driven sport, so it's really cool to have those worlds come together and. 
um, you know, when it comes to getting more women involved in anything, I think so much of it is just showing that they can. And so it's about, you know, if you have, if you're able to hire women who are qualified, like don't hire women just because they're women, but because they're qualified, right. um, I think that's really important. And um, it, it is hard because a lot of these kind of the same thing I talked about with, you know, needing the respect of my team and finding that to be a pretty high obstacle to need to get over. I think the same thing happens in STEM from a cultural perspective, you know, teachers, there are studies that show that teachers grade girls harder in math than they do boys in math in elementary and high school. Hmm. So it's like, you know, we're not even on a level playing field in fifth grade. Um, So with like basic STEM stuff. So um, I think that's really eye opening and I do not know really how you become more objective. You should, you know, teachers should be objective. Um, but yeah, no girls, the t- regardless of if the teacher is man or a woman, girls are graded more harshly on math and science, um, wow. than boys. So there's a lot of obstacles there. Um, and I think, I think from a personal standpoint, understanding why you're on your journey and what your goal is and what, again, what your values are helps center me when I'm going after something that's male dominated is unpleasant. All of the really unpleasant things I've had to do to try to get where I am in terms of dealing with stereotypes, you know, dealing with being the outside or whatever it is, keeping the end goal in mind. And I think this is relevant for anyone breaking into anything difficult. I think it's really important. And when it comes from the STEM side, um, really showing the cool things that you can build. I think that that's really exciting. Mm-hmm. And I wish more girls toys, you know, cause people, you know, still really gender toys, but many girls toys don't work around those motor functions and building and, you know, creating, they're more about storytelling and, and everything. And so I think if we can get girls excited by, you know, using their hands and putting things together, I think that translates later in life. So that was not like the most <laughs> the answer to your question, but there's just so many moving parts. And yeah. as more women and girls see women in positions of STEM power, the more quickly we're going to see change. So more women need to bring up women, more men need to help women and parenting would probably be another. I think parenting is so huge. And like, obviously that's easy for me to say as someone who's not a parent, but like, you know, these studies, I don't think are lying. And, you know, when I bring them to people's attention across the board, people resonate with it. And I think it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of subtle things. And um, it seems fairly, you know, monumentous to have to try to fix these, but it goes down to, you know, the daily things, the little things, encourage, don't, you know, not using the language that, oh, math might be hard, but you should keep doing it. Like, don't even put that notion in (laughs) girls' heads, you know, just, that they need to keep doing it, right? So I have a lot of feelings about <laughs> about this, and I think it's it's tough to tackle all at once, but taking the baby steps as often as we can. Well, oh, awesome. Uh, what's next for Julia? Yeah, great question. So uh, we're finalizing my 2018 schedule right now, and we'll get some you know good racing in the NASCAR series, and continuing to advocate for what I find important, and having these conversations with people like yourself, and you know on stage, and really I'm hoping that I can help people become a little more critical of how they go about doing things, so that they do them in a purposeful way, and to create help and value where I can. I, I love talking to people and hearing their stories, and hearing what what resonates and what makes sense, and I think. You know, we're in a really, really cool time from a cultural standpoint. I think for just people in general becoming more human with each other. And I'm really excited to see what we're able to accomplish. Is there a book in your future? Oh, there might be. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right now I've been working so hard on securing funding for racing that that's really been my focus. Yeah. But yeah, I've been approached. It's, I, I think if I have the time to do it properly, I'd really like to because it's uh, fun to share thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your stories are great. We didn't get to it on uh, on this podcast, maybe a future one. You told, <laughs> yeah, I love the story about, did you fire your dad or you just dad, your dad just swore at you. I can't remember, but there, you've had some, yeah, some, you have some funny stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? In hindsight, I 
totally appreciate it. So <laughs> I think that was yeah. part of your uh, learning about leadership and how to lead a team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's a lot of good lessons out there. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate your time today on The Pivotal Leader. I know you're busy. So uh, thank you for, for being here. And if people want to get a hold of you, know more about you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I mean, this is a great discussion. You asked really, really strong and important questions. So thank you. Um, and then I, I run all my social media and I love hearing from people. So I'm at Julia Landauer on Twitter, Instagram, Julia Landauer on Facebook. That's J-U-L-I-A. L-A-N-D-A-U-E-R. And then there's fun information on my website. So please feel free to reach out. Um, it's, as I said, it's great to talk with everyone. Thanks again to Julia for being on The Pivotal Leader today. And thank you to our listeners for listening. You can find show notes for this episode, including contact information for Julia on our website at thepivotalleader.com. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. You can find this podcast on iTunes. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please leave a rating and a review. And feel free to email me any questions that you might have about employee engagement, customer acquisition, or if you have advice for Julia and I about emotions and how not to be bitches, um, send that to me at Gina at Pivot10.com. And go ahead and message Julia too while you're at it because she would appreciate that. If you know a pivotal leader that should be on this podcast, message me about that too. Maybe that someone is you. So drop me a line and let me know. And until next time, if you're feeling stuck in your business, it's probably time to pivot. You've been listening to The Pivotal Leader with Gina Tremarco, owner and founder of Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv Company. You can find show notes for this episode on our website at thepivotalleader.com. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. If your company needs help pivoting to success, visit pivot10results.com or email Gina at gina at pivot10results.com. And until next time, if you're feeling stuck in your business, it's probably time to pivot.